السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Before we begin, just a quick reminder or an announcement, my dear brothers and sisters, as we are in the spirit of Ashura and the values of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Let's make sure that when it comes to the parking in this area, that we are parking appropriately. Don't block any driveways. This is a residential neighborhood, and in previous years there have been some issues. So let's please keep that in mind, and also let's maintain the cleanliness of the premises and also the neighborhood around us, so that we truly demonstrate the values of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And also here in this blessed hall, let's make sure that we maintain it, that it's clean when we leave the hall, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما. I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger the symbol of His creation, the peak of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And His immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajah. May Allah hasten His reappearance and make us all amongst His sincere and dedicated servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ O Prophet, say to the people, My servants, my creation, O you, who have excessively sinned against your own selves. You're stuck in this world of sins. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا Do not despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the Almighty God forgives all sins, no exceptions. You seek repentance, Allah forgives those sins. إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ For He is the one who always forgives. He is the merciful one. صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. اللهم صلي على محمد وعلى محمد. We extend our condolences to the master of our time, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah, on this tragic occasion. The martyrdom of his grandfather, Al-Imam al Hussein Salawatullahi Alayhi. And I also extend to you, my dear brothers and sisters, my sincerest condolences on the martyrdom of Al-Imam al Hussein. Secondly, I would like to welcome you all to our program in which we gather in the spirit of Ashura to reflect on the teachings of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. As we gather in these nights, we are demonstrating 
to our beloved Imam who sacrificed everything in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who sacrificed for us, for me, for you, to demonstrate to him, O oh Master, we are at your service. We will carry your message and we shall continue your message. In these blessed nights, we invite ourselves to the school of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to purify the heart. Because this is the school of Imam al Hussein. It purifies us, it allows us to better ourselves. It is the great miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has created the human being. Look at this walking, talking human being. It's truly one of the great miracles of God. And this human being has been endowed with amazing, miraculous faculties. One of the greatest dimensions that we human beings have is our emotions. Imagine your life without emotions. Emotions give life to us. In fact, our emotions allow us to taste what life is. Imagine if the human being did not have emotions. You could not experience love, hate, fear, anger, happiness, joy, guilt. What kind of life would we have? We'd be robots. But the Almighty God has equipped the human being with these amazing emotions so that you can truly experience the miracle of life. And all of the emotions, if used properly, allow the human being to better himself, to ascend the ladder of completion. In our discussion tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, I would like to examine the emotion of guilt. It is one of the emotions that is least understood. It's one of the emotions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed the human being with. What purpose does the emotion of guilt serve? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the capacity to experience guilt? Because some people see it as a negative emotion. It's a, it's a burden. It's an uneasy experience or feeling. So why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to experience guilt? Do we have positive guilt? How can we use guilt to repent from our sins? And how is it that the emotion of guilt inspired so many people after the tragedy of Karbala to rise against the tyrants, to repent and to carry the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Let's now examine the emotion of guilt. You might be surprised that it's actually an emotion. If you were to list the emotions, you probably would not list guilt as one of them, right? You would think it's more of a feeling. But many psychologists are confirming that guilt is actually an emotion. It's a fascinating emotion. And they classify guilt in the category of negative or sad emotions. It's a negative emotion. It's a sad emotion. It's one that makes you feel uneasy. That's how we define guilt. When you've done something wrong, you've made a mistake, you've made a violation, you have your moral convictions, you violate those convictions, you believe that you've caused harm or damage, you have failed to meet certain standards or expectations, you feel guilt. It's that bad feeling that you experience that makes you feel uncomfortable when you've made a mistake. That's the definition of the emotion of guilt. Now my dear brothers and sisters, this emotion of guilt, is it a negative emotion or can it be a positive emotion? There are some who claim that the emotion of guilt is a negative emotion. In fact, there are some psychologists who say that the worst emotion, emotion is guilt. Because it wastes your emotional energy. It's a waste. What purpose does it serve? It makes you feel miserable. It doesn't serve any purpose. 
It makes you stuck in the past. I've done something in the past. I keep ruminating and thinking about it. And I'm just stuck. I can't move. It capitulates you. It immobilizes you. So it's a wasted emotion that wastes all of your emotional energy. And therefore it's a negative emotion that we need to free ourselves from and you need to get rid of it so you can stay focused in life. There are some who adopt this extreme understanding of guilt, this extreme opinion. However, my dear brothers and sisters, once you analyze this emotion, you realize that it's one of the greatest gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being. It's completely natural to feel the emotion of guilt. In fact, psychologists say, people who cannot experience guilt, they have some level of psychopathy. These people are psychopaths. They have a mental illness. That's why you see big criminals, serial killers, repeated offenders, these people, what happens to them is that they lose this capacity to experience guilt. And so they keep committing the same crime over and over. It's completely healthy and natural to experience the emotion of guilt. Yes, excessive guilt is unhealthy. There are some people, anything bad that happens, Anything that goes wrong, they blame themselves. And they feel this guilt. Something goes wrong in the family. A problem arises, a challenge comes, they feel guilty about it. They keep blaming themselves when they are not to blame. When others are at fault. Excessive guilt of this sort, where you're blaming yourself for everything that happens, is definitely detrimental to one's psychological and spiritual growth. And indeed, it is this negative guilt that we as believers and followers of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, we need to push aside from our lives. Other than that, we find that the emotion of guilt is indeed a very positive emotion. I would like to share with you some benefits of guilt to better understand this emotion. I would like to share with you what role guilt plays in your life to better appreciate this amazing emotion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed us with. Number one, you find that guilt aids the human being in developing conscience. Without guilt, we would not have a conscience. What is it that awakens your conscience? to know right from wrong, to know that you've made a violation, that I have committed a mistake. What is it that awakens your conscience? It's that feeling of guilt. Because guilt makes you feel bad. When you feel bad, you can't just continue. You have to stop yourself. I feel uneasy. I feel uncomfortable. Why? What has happened? And it beautifully awakens your conscience. And that's why psychologists have noted that children as young as three can actually, actually experience guilt. When they've done something wrong and they know that they've done something wrong, they start feeling guilty. And that is a beautiful internal faculty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to know right from wrong. So the first benefit of guilt, of this emotion, is that it actually allows you to develop your conscience. Without guilt, we would not have a functional conscience. You probably would not see right from wrong. Or if you would, you wouldn't care because you wouldn't feel bad about it. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this aspect of our soul in the Holy Quran. And because it's so significant, Allah takes an oath. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here points us to an nafs al This dimension of our soul that reproaches us, rebukes us for doing wrong. It is this nafs al that awakes your conscience. And the way that is achieved is through the feeling of guilt. That's the first positive benefit of this emotion. The second benefit of the emotion of guilt is that it makes you 
A person who has empathy. Human beings by nature, we're selfish. We just want the goodness for ourselves. It is this feeling of guilt that protects you from selfishness. Because you feel bad about other people. How is it that we have empathy, we human beings? How is it that sometimes when others are suffering, when we've caused them pain, why is it that we feel bad? Why is it that we want their goodness as well? It's because of the emotion of guilt. It actually protects us from being selfish. And that's a wonderful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without guilt, believe me, people would have been so much more selfish. And they would not care, they would not feel bad. All they would think is of their interests, of their comfort. And they would disregard other human beings. So we find that the emotion of guilt actually protects us from selfishness. And because it also creates empathy in our hearts, it brings cooperation amongst human beings. The reason why we have functional societies, in many parts of the world you have harmonious societies, people getting along with one another, is because of the emotion of guilt. Because once you disrupt the social fabric, you cause pain to other people, you wreak havoc in society, you feel bad about it. It's this emotion of guilt that actually discourages you from putting yourself in that situation. So you start cooperating with other people. That's the second benefit. The third benefit to the emotion of guilt is that it protects our relationships with one another. It's this feeling of guilt that stops you from hurting your partner, your spouse, your family members. Believe me, you cannot live with a person who does not have the emotion of guilt. Someone who does not feel guilty, you cannot live with them. Try having a roommate who doesn't feel guilty. Or a spouse who, never, who does not feel guilty. Or a business partner who does not feel guilty. You think you can sustain a relationship like that? It's the emotion of guilt that actually allows us to maintain our relationships. And the thought of this uneasy feeling which guilt generates in us, just the thought of it discourages you from ruining that relationship. So we're always trying to repair our relationships. For most people, for the functional, healthy individual, it's the feeling of guilt that actually motivates you to repair the damage done in a relationship. You violated your spouse. You violated a family member. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awakens this emotion in you to feel bad about it. You can't continue living like that because you won't enjoy your life with that feeling of guilt. So go and do something about it. See how this emotion encourages you to fix your faults and mistakes. If you pay attention to it and use it proactively, it actually helps fix your faults. It helps fixing your mistakes. And speaking about family relationships, studies have shown that here in the United States, the greatest cause of guilt, the single greatest cause of guilt is what? Is people who feel they're not spending enough time with their family members. You're working 15 hours a day, you're busy with your life. You're not giving enough time to your children, to your spouse. You feel guilty, right? That's the biggest, biggest cause of guilt in the United States. That you're not spending enough time with your family members. This actually encourages you to pay attention to them. Pay attention to your wife, to your children. Give them time. Don't be so consumed with your own life and business life. And so it encourages you to dedicate some time to them. Now here's the thing, my dear brothers and sisters. Some people, unfortunately, they have a tendency of taking advantage of guilt in their partner or spouse. They make them feel guilty all the time. And this is something that's wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable for that. How many husbands have you seen? They always make their wives feel guilty. Because they have so high expectations. 
She always feels guilty. Anything she does, she has to feel guilty about it. If she goes and spends an extra hour with her parents, with his in-laws, he makes her feel guilty about it. And she doesn't enjoy it. If she doesn't serve him the way he wants, he makes her feel guilty. And the other way around. There are some husbands, they're really struggling. They're trying to provide for their family. And no matter how much they work, the wife is not satisfied. She's always complaining and making him feel bad and creating the sense of guilt in him. Don't ever make your family members feel guilty, my dear brothers and sisters. This is wrong. Don't think that pain and abuse is just physical pain and abuse. Beating someone, hitting someone. Making someone guilty unrightfully is a sin in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's a type of psychological and emotional abuse. But this always happens in society. So this is the fourth benefit of guilt. The fifth benefit, my dear brothers and sisters, so many studies have shown that teenagers who have a sense of guilt, they are less likely to fall into drugs and immoral paths, illegitimate relationships. This actually protects them. Because that uneasy feeling motivates them to stay on the right path. And this is... Rahma from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now some people ask the following question and psychologists actually ask about this. They say, okay, we have some examples of guilt that's useless and that's annoying. Why is it there? For instance, you go and you buy a fancy suit, a fancy dress, or you go to an expensive restaurant, or the fact that you buy something, you spend something, you feel guilty about it. Because there are others who cannot afford it, right? Have you ever felt guilty? If you've gone to a fancy restaurant and you've shelled out $300 on a meal with your friends or family, sometimes you feel a little bit guilty about that, right? Is this a positive emotion here or is it a negative emotion? It's actually a positive emotion. Why? No, not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want you to enjoy life. Enjoy it. If you go and you buy expensive food, enjoy that. Bil'afiyah, sahtin. Enjoy it as much as you can. But the emotion of guilt serves one important purpose. It makes you a responsible human being. Go and spend and buy, but don't waste. You know how much of the food that we buy, we waste it? 40% of all fresh food in the United States and Canada is thrown in the bin. 40%. Do you know how much money that is in the U.S. every year? Every year Americans waste 180 billion dollars worth of food. 180 billion dollars. That is more than the GDP of hundreds of, of tens of countries combined. That emotion of guilt should stop you from wasting. Buy as much as you want, but don't be wasteful. Wasting resources, you should feel guilty about it. And Allah wants you to feel guilty about it. So it stops you from wasting. That's number one. Number two, think of the poor. Yes, when you go and buy something and you kind of feel guilty about it, use this guilt proactively, positively. Go and give and sponsor an orphan. Make a donation. See, without the feeling of guilt, we would not do that. We would not feel bad about poor people around the world who are suffering. We wouldn't care. And it allows you to appreciate the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, even guilt that is experienced when you spend, when you're enjoying your life, is actually a positive emotion here. It's aimed at making you responsible. So you use the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appropriately. Now there is one type of guilt, my dear brothers and sisters, that I would like to bring to your attention. And this is a negative type of guilt that is experienced by some people. And they need to understand that they should not feel guilty about this. Sometimes you're stuck in a situation in your life. For example, you have a disability and you feel constantly guilty about it. There are many people with disabilities, they experience severe depression because they feel guilty. My parents are stuck with me. They have to care for me. My siblings, 
other people, other family members, other friends, and they constantly feel guilty. They feel uneasy. They feel bad. They cannot enjoy anything. Why am I a burden on others? And they feel guilty about that. My dear brothers and sisters, don't ever feel guilty about that. When something is beyond your capacity, there's nothing you can do about it. It's something willed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A disease, a disability. Don't feel bad about it. It's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, realize it's an opportunity for your family members, for your parents to seek reward and compensation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Families who have a disabled family member, that's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is giving them an opportunity to show care and compassion to that disabled person. Do you know how much Allah compensates them? Do you know how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them? This is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not something that you should feel guilty about. Leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let that take you to severe depression like it does to many people. We find that this beautiful emotion that Allah has created in us is one that awakens our conscience, my dear brothers and sisters. It helps us see right from wrong. And when we slip into a negative path, it makes us feel uneasy so that we can change that path. Now there is one distinction to make here, my dear brothers and sisters, because sometimes they get mixed up. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Shame, for the most part, is negative. Guilt is the feeling that you experience when you've done something wrong, because that action is disturbing you. That's good, that's positive. But there are some people who feel excessive shame such that they start self-loathing and they start hating themselves. Never identify yourself through a mistake that you've done. Many people fall into this trap, my dear brothers and sisters. And it makes them feel miserable, depressed, and they lose hope. Don't self-identify with an act, even if it's a sin. A believer is one who does not have hatred towards himself. himself. I've heard this from many people who struggle with depression. And this is exactly what they'll say. Say it, I feel I'm worthless. I'm worthless. I'm not worthy of anything. Even when you ask them to do some recommended acts of prayer, to even pray, no, I'm not worthy of praying. You see that self-hate? This is negative. Regardless of what you've done, in the end, who created you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you not be worthy? Yes, be humble about it. Don't let that make you arrogant. But in the end, you are the creation of God. He's the manufacturer and you're the product. Don't develop self-hate because this is definitely something that will ruin your life. It will take the hope and the energy from your heart. Despise the action, but don't despise yourself. Subhanallah, in a beautiful hadith, Imam al-Sadiq teaches one of his companions who rebuked another companion for doing something wrong, and he attacked him. He attacked his personality. The Imam salam said, don't judge his personality. Don't attack his character. Don't condemn his character, condemn his action. Yes, if someone did something wrong publicly, you have to show a stance. You have to show that it's unacceptable. Condemn the action, but don't condemn the person. Make a distinction between the person and the action. That's how you see your brothers and sisters in society. Always make a distinction between their actions and their character. You can critique an action, that's fine. But don't destroy their character. They have dignity. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam beautifully in Dua Arafah, in that last part, he beautifully reminds us how much self worth we have because Allah is the one who created us. He says, Ilahi, kayfa asta'izzu wa fi dhillati arkaztani. He says, Oh Allah, how can I have self worth? honor, dignity, a high status, when I'm so low, and that's my reality. Look at the human being. 
What is this human being? We're miserable. We're so weak. But sometimes we become arrogant. The Imam السلام, does state that, so nobody becomes arrogant. But then the Imam السلام, beautifully states after that, but how can I feel worthless when you have attributed me to you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَكَيْفَ لَا أَسْتَعِزُّ وَإِلَيْكَ نَسَبْتَنِي How can I not feel that worth when you are my creator and you're the one who created me? And I am your product, I am your creation. See how the Imam السلام, speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be humble, but at the same time realize that you have a lot of self-worth. So there's a difference between guilt and shaming yourself putting yourself down and saying, I'm a bad person. I'm such a bad father. I'm such a worthless mother. I'm such a worthless daughter. Don't ever say that. Yes, look at your action and try to fix your mistakes. But don't start hating yourself because if you fall into this path, it becomes extremely dangerous, my dear brothers and sisters. We find that when we want to continue our path of tawbah and repentance, my dear brothers and sisters. We find that the emotion of guilt is instrumental in bringing you to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you examine the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, and the traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we see that there is this emphasis on regret. Nadam. There is this emphasis on feeling regretful. In fact, one hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa he says, "Anadamu tawba." Feeling remorse, feeling regret in itself is a type of repentance. If you really want to know if Allah has accepted your repentance, if you're truly and sincerely repenting, ask yourself, "Do I have remorse? Genuine remorse? Do I really feel guilty about what I did or no?" If you don't feel guilty about the sin that you've committed, in reality you're not repenting. You must feel guilty. Because that guilt reveals sincerity. That you truly mean it. You're honest. You're genuine about it. Without this feeling of guilt, how can you demonstrate that you really are repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Kafa bin nadami tawbah in another hadith. It suffices for regret to be repentance. In another hadith we find, Al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he describes the stages of repentance. He says, you want Allah to forgive you? Here are the stages. Number one, the first stage, the first step is to feel bad about your sin. Is to feel remorseful. That's the first step. The next step is to fix the mistake that you've done. You violated someone, go and apologize. You've taken someone, you've confiscated someone's rights, go and give it back to them. You have missed obligations, missed prayers. Imagine if I have years of missed prayers and I just sit there and say, Astaghfirullah, oh Allah forgive me. That's not enough. Start making them up. That's how you show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are sincere. And then the Imam alayhi salam beautifully as a last step, he says, if you really want Allah to forgive you and to show that sincerity when you're repenting, just as you allowed your body to taste the sweetness of sinning, allow that same body part to taste the difficulty of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I use my eyes to sin, you want to compensate for that sin? You want to expiate for it? Use those eyes in Allah's obedience. Read and seek knowledge. Allah will forgive your sins. Read the Holy Quran. Look at your parents with compassion. See how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trains us if we want to repent. You use these hands to sin. You use this body to sin. Use it in Allah's obedience. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will consider that as expiation for your sins. That's how you demonstrate that your tawbah is actually sincere. Some people unfortunately, they don't feel bad about their sins. One of the conditions of shafa'ah, 
This is a hadith from the Prophet He says one of the conditions of intercession of shafa'a is to feel bad about your sin. The Prophet says if you sin and you don't feel bad about it, tough luck. How can I intercede for you when you don't even care about your sins? We must feel regretful. Moderate regret, of course. Moderate guilt. Not something that's excessive. That makes us severely depressed and stuck. But you need to feel that regret in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins. Because it is this feeling of regret that will motivate you to compensate for the wrong that you've done. Two, three decades ago, there was a very respected scholar, a marja in the holy city of Qom, al marashi and Najafi, may Allah bless his soul. I've heard this from a number of scholars who narrate the story from him. He says that he, there was a man who seemed to be a very righteous man. He looked very righteous from the outside. You know, subhanAllah, sometimes the outside is very deceiving. That's why you should never judge a person according to their appearance. Even if someone looks religious, don't quickly judge and say, okay, this person is an angel. Or if someone is not, does not look religious, don't quickly judge them. This person can be better than you. You're the one who th you think you're religious. He says, there was a person, I trusted him. He seemed very trustworthy. He seemed very religious. He used to pray with us. So I would give him money for some religious projects. Years and years I would give him money, trusting that he is spending on a religious project. He's getting a religious act done. He says, after many years, and this man was old, after many years, this man came to me. He told me, Sayyid, I have a big confession to make. You remember, all these years you've given me the money to perform a religious duty? Well, guess what? I never performed it. All those years I never performed it. And I took that money, unrightfully. But now I feel really guilty about it. And I'm getting gold. I don't know what's going to happen to my fate. So I thought I'd come and I'd tell you. Now imagine this marja, all these years he's trusting him with this money so he can complete a task, a project. And suddenly he's told that he's not done any of those tasks. He became angry, he became furious. He told him, how dare you do something like this? Not only did you betray me, you betrayed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you betrayed the people. How can you do something sinful like that? All these years I trusted you. He said, look, I knew you were going to get upset with me. And you have the right to be upset with me. But this is the reality. Now see how this old man used guilt to fix his mistake. He did not stop there and say, okay, whatever, I'm going to continue my life. He told him, tell me, what do I need to do? How can I fix this mistake? How can I repent from this sin? He told him, you really want to repent from this sin? All that money that you took over these years, you give it back. You give it back to me and I'll spend it in its appropriate place. You have to give it all back. You're liable for it. Now the guy was poor. He didn't have that much money to give back. He told him, I'll do that. If Allah will forgive me, I will do that. He told him, how will you do that? You're poor. You don't own a lot of money. He said, I have a shop. And this shop generates an income for me. If I sell this shop, I can give you back the money. Ask yourselves, brothers and sisters, would you do that? If after years and years you decide you have to sell your business because it was haram business, haram money. All these years you violated your business partner and that's how you made your millions. And now if you want to repent, you have to give your business to your partner. It belongs to your partner. Are you willing to do that? It's not easy. But this man said, yes, I will. I'm willing to do it. The marja told him, but if you sell your shop, how are you going to live? How are you going to sustain your family? He told him, I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the sustainer. He'll take care of me. He went and he sold his shop and he gave back the money to the marja. And that's how he sought the repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Days later, 
this scholar, this marja was informed that that man passed away. The time had come for him and he passed away. See how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified him from that sin right before he passed away. Because he felt genuinely remorseful and guilty about that sin. You see the role of guilt, my dear brothers and sisters, in bringing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam has a beautiful statement. The Imam salam in speaking about the role of remorse, of nadam, the Imam beautifully states, غَرَسُوا أَشْجَارَ ذُنُوبِهِمْ نُصْبَ عُيُونِهِمْ وَقُلُوبِهِمْ The Imam salam says, okay, you've created a tree from sins. Now you're stuck with this tree. How do you get rid of this tree? How do you turn this negative, sinful tree into a positive one? The Imam salam says, وَسَقَوْهَا بِمَا إِنَّدَمْ فَأَثْمَرَتْ لَهُمُ السَّلَامَ وَأَعْقَبَتْهُمُ الرِّضَى وَالْكَرَامَ The Imam salam says, they water this tree of sin with what? With the water of remorse, the water of guilt. And through that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns that sinful tree into peace. And it's interesting that the Imam salam uses the example of a tree. Because have you seen a tree? What does a tree do? Have you seen fruit trees? In order for a fruit tree to give you the best fruits, you would fertilize it, right? In the past, they would use natural fertilizer. Have you ever seen natural fertilizer? Have you ever smelled the stench of it? It's disgusting, right? It's something that is very unpleasant. The odor of it, the nature of it. But the tree takes this nasty material, the natural fertilizer, and it converts it into wonderful fruits for you to eat, right? See the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't that amazing? That it takes this nasty thing in this world, object, and it converts it into a beautiful, aromatic, fragrant fruit. And that's exactly what repentance done, does, my dear brothers and sisters. Repentance takes your sins and it converts them into good deeds. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, أُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّرُ اللَّهُ سَيِّعَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Allah says the, those who truly repent, they sincerely repent. All those sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will transform them into good deeds. That's the power of tawbah, my dear brothers and sisters. And in these nights, as you have come to the majlis of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, realize that the Imam is inviting us to change, my dear brothers and sisters. Regardless of what you've done in your life, this is the opportunity to say, Oh Allah, I feel guilty about what I've done, but I am willing to change. And I will use the message of an Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to change myself. Read Munajat at Ta'ibin by Al Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. Have you read the supplication? The whispers of the repenters, Munajat at Ta'ibin. Beautiful words by Al Imam Zain al Abidin. إلهي ألبستني الخطايا ثوب مذلتي. Look at the beautiful words of your Imam. He says, Oh Allah, my sins, my mistakes have made me wear a cloth of humiliation. Yes, when I sin, I humiliate myself because I lower my status. Every sin lowers us, my dear brothers and sisters. But repentance allows you to elevate yourself. And then the Imam salam says, وَأَمَاتَ قَلْبِي عَظِيمُ جِنَايَتِي Oh Allah, my grave sins have caused my heart to die. They've taken the life from my heart. فَأَحْيِهِ بِتَوْبَةٍ مِنْكَ يَا أَمَلِي وَيَا بُغْيَتِي Oh Allah, revive this dead heart. How does it get revived? Through repentance. Oh Allah, forgive me. And that's how you will give life back into my heart. فَوَأَسَفَ مِنْ خَجْلَتِي وَافْتِضَاحِي Oh Allah, how shameful do I feel. 
what if I get exposed for my sins? But then you turn to Allah because you know your Lord will conceal your sins. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will erase your sins. أَسْأَلُكَ يَا غَافِرَ الذَّنْبِ الْكَبِيرِ وَيَا جَابِرَ الْعَظْمِ الْكَسِيرِ Oh Allah, I ask you, you're the one who forgives even the greatest of sins, even the big sin, oh Allah, you forgive it. أَنْتَهَ بَالِيمُ بِقَاتِ الْجَرَائِرِ وَتَسْتُرَ عَلَيَّ فَاضِحَاتِ السَّرَائِرِ Oh Allah, I trust that you are going to conceal my sins. You're not going to expose me, oh Allah. This is how a believer looks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a merciful creator who will cover your past, who is going to conceal your sins. If you repent on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not expose you. Here in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also not expose you. Then the Imam salam says, Ilahi in kana nadamu ala dhambi tawbatu fa inni wa izzatika mina nadimi He says, Oh Allah, if remorse, if feeling guilty about sins is repentance, then I swear by your glory, O Allah, I have repented. And you see, this is how the believer trains himself to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's use the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to purify this heart, my dear brothers and sisters. But at the same time, as we are expecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, we also should forgive other people. Don't leave this majlis tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, without forgiving your brothers and sisters, even those who have violated you. If they've apologized, if they have expressed regret, give them a chance. You know what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says? If I believe in the message of Imam al Hussein, I will believe in the statement from the Imam. He says, My grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi states, The one who does not accept the apology of the one who's asking you to forgive them, if you don't accept their apology, even if you think they're not that sincere, من محق أو مبطل Even if you think the person is not sincere and you don't forgive them, you don't accept their apology, the Prophet ﷺ says, this person is not from us. I will not intercede for this person. Because when you seek the shafa'a, the intercession of the Prophet, in reality you're saying to the Prophet, Oh Rasulullah, ask Allah to forgive me for my sins, to let go, I'm apologizing it. You expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you, but you don't forgive other people. Forgive them. And Imam al Hussein says, forgive them. The one who apologizes, forgive them, even if you don't think they're that sincere. But now that they're asking for your apology, let go of the past. Let go of their mistake. Then, my grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, will intercede on your behalf. As we are commemorating the tragedy of Karbala, my dear brothers and sisters, we find that this emotion of guilt actually awakened the Ummah after the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. It primarily affected the people of Kufa. After the Imam was martyred, a group of people in Kufa, they gathered. They felt extremely guilty. And this emotion of guilt inspired them to rise, to support the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and to fight the corrupt Umayyad dynasty. A group of people in Kufa, they gathered. They told themselves, what's happening? How did we betray Abi Abdullah al Hussein? How did we not rush to his support? There were five leaders to this revolution that was about to take place. And the most noble of them was one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Sulaiman ibn Surd al-Khuza'i. Ibn Surd al-Khuza'i. This man was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He was born 28 years before the Hijrah. He met the Prophet. He was from Yemen. And he participated in the battle of Khandaq. He was in Kufa after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. He gathered with a number of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. 
And they told themselves, how did we betray Abi Abdullah al Hussein by not supporting him? So they led a movement called Thawrat al Tawabin, the revolution of the repenters, driven by extreme guilt. They gathered in a place called Nukhayla, 4,000 of them. Initially, there were 16,000 who pledged them allegiance, who pledged Sulaiman allegiance, but then 4,000 of them showed up, they went to Karbala. They stayed for about two days by the grave of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam crying, weeping, feeling regretful and remorseful. How did we betray you, O oh Abba Abdullah? They would recite poetry to express their sorrow, their sadness for the Imam salam. And then they went to a place called Ain al-Warda where they met the army of Ibn Ziyad. Now the army of Ibn Ziyad was 30,000. These repenters were only 4,000. They were no match for that big army, but they wanted to demonstrate a point that we will compensate for our betrayal of Imam al Hussein because we, the people of Kufa, we invited him. And we were not quick in supporting the Imam. Salam. We feel regretful, but now we are willing to sacrifice our lives. All of these 4,000 were martyred over there because they wanted to demonstrate to the world that we will carry the message of Imam al Hussein. So many revolutions, my dear brothers and sisters, were sparked after the battle of Karbala because people felt guilty. Al Mukhtar al Thaqafi was one of them. He also led a later revolution to seek vengeance from the killers of Imam al Hussein, all those who participated in killing the Imam. And that's how we find that the dynasty of the Umayyads collapsed. Finally, the Ummah went back to its conscience. How did we betray the message of Imam al Hussein? You see the role of guilt in awakening the conscience. And there is no vivid example, my dear brothers and sisters, like the example of Al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi. Al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi was one of the warriors of Kufa. He was known to be one of the most courageous men of Kufa. He goes with 1,000 soldiers to intercept the army of Al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. In nights like this, in a night like this, because it was on the second of Muharram that Al Imam al Hussein arrived the land of Karbala. On a night like this, the Imam alayhi salam was on his way to Kufa. But Al-Hur ibn Yazid al riyahi with 1,000 soldiers, he intercepts the Imam. He blocks the Imam <coughs> from going to Kufa. The Imam salam then has to change his journey from Kufa and he heads towards Karbala. Al-Hur ibn Yazid al riyahi did not really think that Ibn Ziyad wanted to kill Al-Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He was confused, he did not know. On the day of Ashura, when he sees that the battle is becoming serious, Umar ibn Sa'd, the commander of the army, he had come with 4,000 fighters, and he was talking about slaughtering Imam al Hussein and his companions. Al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi, he goes to Umar ibn Sa'd and he tells him, Do you really want to kill this man? Do I really sense that you want to kill Hussein? He said, oh yes, there's going to be a fierce battle. You are going to see hands and feet being amputated. You think this is not serious? Of course we're going to kill him. He told him, but why kill him? Just let him go back from where he came from. He said, I will go back. He said, no. Either he pledges allegiance to Yazid or we shall kill him. At that point, when Hur sees that this is serious, the emotion of guilt starts to wake awaken his conscience. One of his friends, he sees him shaking. He tells him, Hur, you're shaking? Why? You're one of the most courageous men that I know. On such a day, I would expect to see your courage. Why is it that I see you shaking? He tells him, I see myself between hell and heaven. Hell is on this side and heaven the camp of Abi Abdullah al Hussein is on the other side. And I swear by Allah, I shall not choose anything over paradise. He goes, he lowers his head, and he approaches Al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He felt ashamed. 
When he approached him, the Imam السلام, looked at him. Who are you? He told him, Sayyidi, my master, I am the one who intercepted you. I am the one who put fear in the hearts of your children. Yes, it was a major sin. How can you do that to the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ? The women and the children, they were terrorized by the army of Hur when they intercepted them. And he stopped the Imam from going to Kufa to meet his supporters. He tells him, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, I am the one with this history. I've committed this huge mistake. But Aba Abdullah, is there room for repentance? Can I repent? Look at the compassionate heart of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. He tells him, In tub Allahu alayhi. Yes, if you truly seek repentance, Allah will forgive you. This is the message of Abi Abdullah Al Hussein. On such a night, the Imam invites you to repent, to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of what we've done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He lets go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us for our sins. He tells him, Okay, Abu Abdullah, but now I have to compensate for my sin. Allow me to go and to speak to the army and to try to give them advice. He goes, he gives a powerful speech. He admonishes them, but of course they don't listen. Then he comes back to Imam al Hussein. He tells him, My master, allow me to be the first one who is killed from your supporters. I want to compensate for my sin. Allow me to be the first one to be a martyr. And he becomes a martyr in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the message of Karbala, my dear brothers and sisters. In these nights as we gather, yes, we experience sadness and sorrow, but let's learn from the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I want to take your hearts to the homes of the Imams and how they would commemorate Ashura. The Imam alayhi salam, Al Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam, Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, when the month of Muharram would start, I would see my father, he would become depressed. كان أبي إذا دخل شهر المحرم لا يرى ضاحكا. He says, when Muharram would start, my father, Imam al-Baqir, he would no longer smile. This was a moment of sadness for him. This was a moment of sorrow. I would see my father in extreme grief. He would feel depressed for what happened to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, whenever they would experience a, tra a tragedy, they would always remember the tragedy of their grandfather Hussein. Once the evil ruler Al Mansur al Abbasi, he commanded his general or his governor in Medina to attack the house of Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. They attacked the house of Al Imam al Sadiq and they set the door of Al Imam al Sadiq to fire. And the fire encroached into the house of the Imam alayhi salam. The Imam he had to protect the women and the children from that fire and he himself he extinguished, ex extinguished the fire. The next day, one of his companions went to see him. He went to see Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. He saw the Imam agonized. He saw the Imam severely depressed. He told him, what's the matter? Why do I see you in this state? You're actually crying. He told him what happened the day before our house was attacked. My house was set to fire. The man told him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, O grandson of the Prophet, you should be strong. This is normal to you, the Ahlul Bayt. This is not the first time that your house is attacked. This is not the first tragedy. Why do I see you crying? You know what the Imam السلام, told him? The Imam told him, Oh man, do not blame me. When I saw my women and children running from one room to another room to protect themselves from the fire, I remembered the day of Ashura when my aunt Zainab when my aunts, when the women and the children would run from one tent to another. Because the tents were set on fire on the day of Ashura. And the evil commander of Yazid's army, he would say, 
burn the house of the oppressors. He's saying this about the family of Imam al Hussein. And Imam al Sadiq says, when I, re when I saw this scene in my house, I remembered the tragedy of Karbala. That's why I'm crying. I'm crying for my grandfather, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. This is how the Ahlul Bayt, my dear brothers and sisters, would experience these days with difficulty. They would have gatherings in their homes. As Sayyid Al Hamyari, he was a famous poet. He says, I visited an Imam Al Sadiq alayhi salam. He told me, Do you read poetry? He said, Yes, I compose poetry. He says, I want to hear some lines of poetry, eulogizing and commemorating my grandfather Hussein. He says, the Imam, he put a curtain, he called the women and the children, and I read lines of poetry and they would cry. This is how the Ahlul Bayt would experience these days, my dear brothers and sisters. Even before that, the Holy Prophet You know how many times Rasulullah would cry, when he would see his beloved Imam Hussein السلام, his beloved grandson Hussein, once Rasulullah went into his room, he told Um Salama, I want to rest, I want to meditate with my Lord. I don't want anyone disturbing me. Don't allow anyone to come into my room. Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet, she says, I saw Imam al Hussein, I saw Hussein. He was a young boy, maybe three years old. He started running towards the room and he slipped from my hands. He managed to enter the room. I tried to stop him, but I couldn't. She said, I approached the room of the Prophet. Initially, the Prophet was happy to see his grandson Hussein. Then I heard the Prophet weeping and crying. I thought maybe Hussein is disturbing the Prophet. Let me go and take him out of the room. She says, I went inside the room. I saw Hussein on the chest of Rasulullah. And the Prophet was crying. He was weeping, sobbing. I told him, what's the matter? Is Hussein disturbing you? He said, no, he's not disturbing me. But as he was on my chest, as I was playing with my beloved Hussein, Jibra'il descended upon me. He told me, Ya Rasulullah, do you love your grandson? I said, yes. Jibra'il told me, what would you do? Ya Rasulullah, let me tell you, one day your own nation, this ummah is going to kill your grandson. And that's why I was crying. When we cry in these nights, we are following the path of Rasulullah. We're following the Messenger of Allah. He is the one who te teaches us to grieve over Al Imam Al Hussein السلام, and to learn from his lessons. And finally, my dear brothers and sisters, I'll share with you a quick scene between Da'bil Al Khuza'i, the famous poet, and Al Imam Al Rida. He was in the presence of Al Imam Al Rida. Al Imam Al Rida السلام, says, Read some lines of poetry. I want to hear something about my grandfather Hussein. He read these beautiful lines, Madaris Ayatin Khalat Min Tilawatin Wa Mahbat Wahyin Mukfarul Arasati. He starts his poetry by saying, These homes in which the revelation, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be revealed. These homes in which the Holy Qur'an would be recited, but now these homes are empty. Which homes are these? O oh, Da'bil, tell us. Diyaru Aliyan wal Hussein wa Ja'far wa Hamzata wa Sajjad dhin thafanati. These are the homes of Ali ibn Abi Talib, of Hamza. These are the homes of Ja'far. These are the homes of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. What happened to these homes? Now these homes are empty. And Imam al Rida is now emotional. He's about to break into tears until he mentions this tragedy of Al Imam al Hussein. When Da'bil says, Afatim ulaw khiltil Hussein mujaddalayat. وقد مات عطشانا بشط فراتي أو فاطمة If you were to see your beloved son Hussein slaughtered by the river of Furat, what would you do? 
إذا للطمت الخد فاطم عنده وأجريت دمع العين في الوجنات أو oh, فاطمة You would slap your cheek if you were to see your grandson, your beloved Hussein sleeping on the grounds of Karbala martyred by the river of Furat Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands in dua. This is the moment of dua. Allah has promised us with tears, with broken hearts, He will answer our prayers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to hasten the reappearance of our Master Al Imam Al Mahdi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to give. Speedy recovery to those who are ill, to those who are suffering. Pray for them, my dear brothers and sisters. There are many who are going through struggles. This is the moment in which we beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them relief and to give them a speedy recovery. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the shafa'ah of Al-Imam Al-Husayn. Wa ila arwah al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat. Nuhdi thawab surat al-fatiha. Masbuqatan bil-salati ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.